Um, welcome everyone to our call um, and this breakout session today. That is the focus essentially is the panel on urgent the urgency of ERGs um, in leadership in unprecedented times. So um, my name is Eunice Kajoba. My pronouns are she, her. I'll be your, your moderator today. I, I'm, as I've mentioned a, a second ago, I'm Halen from Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, and I am currently an HR partner within the strategy and consulting practice um, at Accenture. So my involvement in roles within ERG is I've co-led um, the local chapter of BOLD, um, Black Outreach, Learning and Development, our Black employee ERG at Accenture, um, as well as supporting our local LGBTQ plus employee research group. So I'm really excited to be here and really excited to um, moderate this panel and introduce the three amazing panelists we have here. So first up, I'd like to introduce Madhavi Bassin. So Madhavi leads diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Okta and has 10 plus years of experience in the space of social change and building inclusive processes and spaces. So we're very lucky to have her with us. Um, our next guest is Torin Perez. Torin co-led the launch of Bloomberg's first Black ERG in 2013 and now is a sought after keynote speaker and DEI consultant. Uh, he's been featured by Culture Amp as a DNI influencer you should know and in Forbes as an anti racism educator your company needs now. So, welcome, Tori. And then, last but not least, we have Ileana uh, Quinones. So, Ileana is a trailblazing Latina in tech whose mission is to create and scale positive impact in the world by building high performing teams, developing people leaders, and amplifying the voices of Latin ERGs and URMs. She is an executive advisor to the Latino Force, Salesforce at Latinx ERG, um, a podcast presenter with Beyond Barriers, and a thought after career coach and mentor. So Ilana, her, for her day job, is the lead to the team of solution engineers who pride themselves in creating impactful business solutions for Salesforce customers. So as you can see, we have an amazing group of panelists here and welcome all of you um, to this uh, this conversation with us. And I'd just like to, before hopping into some of the questions and experiences and backgrounds from our panel speakers, I'd just like to say, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll be, I'll be checking in there. If you have a question for one panel speaker or all of them, feel free to pop them there. And um, preferably use the Q&A side of the chat because um, that'll be easier to kind of sort out your different questions if you have them. So. We'll, we'll start off. Um, before we kind of get into some of the questions uh, that we have here, I thought, you know, we don't know where everyone's at on their diversity and inclusion um, journey. We don't know, you know, if you're aware of employee resource groups or not aware of employee resource groups. So I thought we would start off with like a quick definition of what an ERG is, you know, for our conversation and maybe we can build off and, and add from that. So I'll read the Wikipedia definition of this just so everybody has a baseline understanding. Um, and essentially employee resource groups. So those are groups, um, those are groups of employees who join together in the workplace based on shared characteristics of life experiences. ERGs are generally based on providing support, enhancing career development, and contributing to personal development in the work environment. So this is the Wikipedia definition of ERGs, but really to add on to that, um, one part that's missing is how ERGs can actually serve as a partner to the business and help drive business goals and strategy. And so that's a big theme of what we'll be discussing today about that leadership value within um, our ERGs. All right. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hop into some of these questions. Um, so the first one we, we kind of have here to, to kick up our conversation is really learning more about um, a moment where you personally sort of had this realization um, about the your organization um, and your professional or personal impact of ERGs and, and how did that inform your perspective of the purpose? So just learning about your journey um, of how you, you know, started an ERG, you know, how you, you saw the purpose and vision within ERGs. Um, maybe we can start off with uh, Torin, if you'd be able to share. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Appreciate the energy in the chat so far. Um, you know, this is an incredible time right now that we are living in. And um, I get a chance to speak in front of a lot of different groups, uh, corporate organizations that are trying to strive towards the ideals of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, some of whom came out with their press releases and their statements and their Twitter posts last year in the wake of all of the horrific racial injustices that we all witnessed in the middle of a pandemic where we couldn't look away and are now talking about things like race and racism and anti-racism and white supremacy and 
what does it actually mean to stand up for humanity, to stand up for the people who are within our care, within our organizations. And um, I like to think back to my beginnings, which was really inspired by my involvement in uh, the first founded Black Employee Resource Group at Bloomberg LP about eight years ago. Um, I didn't have the words to describe exclusion or lack of belonging back then, but I can tell you that being one of the only two people of color on the media sales team and being the only black person on that team, I definitely had some of those kinds of experiences. I got really lucky because there were some tenured black employees within the organization who were getting ready to launch that first group and they invited me to be a part of the launch team for that. And so I was co-chair of the awareness committee, um, a big voice and a big influencer for people who were joining um, the, the newly formed ERG um, being a part of all the event planning for, for programs that we were putting on, elevating the importance of the business case and um, getting in front of some of our executive leaders who were um, trying to figure out how do we embed this into what we're doing and how do we create a, a, a community. Now, I will tell you that back then, I was just happy to have safe space to be around people that look like me, right? Like I just wanted to, you know, dap up somebody, give them a pound and feel better about my day. Um, but then I realized as I got deeper and deeper into that work that there's a lot that goes into uh, creating that kind of community. And also not just the community, but creating the environment for talent to thrive, whether that's retention or recruitment or advancement. Um, and then also within the wider community, you're thinking about different stakeholders that you could you could reach beyond because of your products and your services. And so I'll say that, you know, that journey and the impact that I was able to have there and getting recognized by leadership for what I was able to, to contribute was a big inspiration for me starting my own company, which I've been running for the last seven years and has put me on stages like this. Um, and so that's what I'll say to start, um, but it's definitely led me to a lot of spaces. I've had a lot of conversations with ERG leaders from those that have zero dollars in budget and whose leaders constantly ch challenge them and say, prove your existence, prove why you should be here, to those that are saying, we are just guiding this. And we've got the head of a division, so money's not a problem, okay? And so I've seen both of those sides of the coin, and it's, and it's really important for us to recognize that in this time um, of, of unprecedented issues that we are dealing with, our voices have been more important now than ever. So I'll stop there. Yeah, great. Well, thank thank you so much for for sharing that perspective. And Torn definitely would would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think even when looking at our experiences um, at Accenture with with ERGs and me coming into into that role, it definitely started off as something that I thought was just more of like a a smaller, not really seeing the impact it could have on the on the business and on the business scale, and having our voices being heard in that sense. Until we had um, you know the resurgence within the Black Lives Matter movement and just having you know leadership come in recognize how our ear the value that was in our erg and how what we could be contributing to sort of um how we drive our business and make changes within our organization like our our black employee resource group went from being so small and minor to not that many people thinking about it going to it but becoming a huge centerpiece within our, our organization and, and having a lot more conversations and involvement with our leadership team it was just really um it was huge to see that trans transformation happen and i think that's because of the events that we've been seeing unfold in this past past year that's really led to, to drive that change. Um, so I want to pivot to, to maybe uh, Ileana, you can share your experience. Absolutely. Thank you, Eunice. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be in the panel and welcome everyone. Um, so along with what you just said, Torin and Eunice, I think one of the big um, breakthroughs for me as part of an ERG and when I realized that, hey, ERGs are really, really important, not just for diversity and for the employees, but also for the ecosystem in any company, right? When you're talking about customers and partners. Once about uh, five years ago, I joined Salesforce and uh, the Latino force was a Latinx employee group, but it was not formalized yet until a year later when our chief diversity officer came in. So that year, actually, we launched the first formal activities of Latino Force as part of Dreamforce, which is the flagship event for the company. And it's a big event in San Francisco, hundreds of thousands of people join. And when we launched that, we had one session, one evening session, it was like a party, like a Latin party, but we invited our partners, our customers that were coming at us from the US, but also from Latin America, from Europe, from places like Spain, and everybody was like getting to this place and the comment that you could hear on and on and over and over again was, we didn't know Salesforce care about diversity. 
And we didn't know that we were an important part of their business and their day to day. And uh, that was amazing. That was like an eye opener for us, not just to say that so far ERGs have been thought of there as some um, nice places to be, affinity groups, mostly internal bound, mostly for the employees. But when you extend that reach into your partners, into your customers, it can really, really show the power of uh, what representation actually can do for you and for your company. So that was one big eye opener for, for me. And I think it was a pivotal point for the, for the ERG as a whole. And then the second one I'd like to mention is um, Maybe some of you remember about two years ago or one and a half years ago, time flies with the pandemic and everything. But when we were having the issues at the border, especially for, for Latin families and like Latin migrants, right? It was a crisis and uh, not really all the, the ERGs were called upon, all the Latin related ERGs and companies were called upon. What happened at our company was that over a weekend, our CEO, Mark Benioff, was reaching out to the leadership team, to the president of Latino Force to get their take on the problems at the border. Just to see what can we do about it? How can we communicate internally to our employees? How can we communicate externally to our customers about what our position is and how can we help solve the problem? So I think at that point, it was also pretty clear that, hey, we're not just an affinity group. We can now also influence and participate in policy making inside the company, in the participation that the company has in the community. And in general, what is our positioning and our standing and things that are important to the community as a whole, not just for the community internally, but the community externally too. So I think those two examples, uh, I wanted to share them because one of them was more internal facing for us to realize that, hey, this is taking a massive impact. And the second one is the sky's the limit in terms of the contributions that the NERG can do for the communities, both again, internal, internal and external too. And I think you really highlighted a, a good part there about how um, the the company reached out for advising from the from the ERG because I think that's sometimes a, a, a part that really separates a good um, business you know connecting with their ERGs versus one that kind of puts the onus on them to do all the work right Absolutely. like an ERG being an advisor versus being the ones to have to do all of that work and putting the onus on 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 the people within that group right so I Absolutely. think that's really important to, to kind of highlight that that as well and maybe we'll touch a bit more on it in some of the later questions but yeah thank you for for mentioning that um and so Mojave, i don't want to leave you, you leave you last but i want you to to hear your thoughts um on this as well and your experiences definitely thank you i bring a slightly different approach to this so i've kind of worked with a lot of ergs kind of inside slash outside so i've led a lot of like women and youth empowerment development projects with different companies and the way we interacted with a lot of like getting um mentors and support for our program was through the ERG groups. That was like kind of, because there is so much passion in that group. So it's very easy to tap into that and get the support that like being from the nonprofit side when I was there, like I needed that passion was like the driving force. And that made me realize like the amount of time and effort and energy and commitment that the ERGs put in was amazing. Like I have always been in the capacity building state, but I would in, in the space, but I would definitely say seeing those ERGs operate was actually a point, was a turning point in my career where I was like, I need to pivot to a role where I can support what they are doing because they are doing so much and these voices need to be amplified. So I definitely owe a lot of my transition to the formal DNI space, to the passion and the empowerment that I've seen come from the ERGs. And on the corporate side, it's been interesting Heading DNI, I work with a lot of employee resource groups, definitely like helping uh, with supporting the programming and the budgeting. But I would definitely say, I know we just like opened up this session with the Wikipedia definition of ERGs. I usually define ERGs by saying like they are the nervous system of your company. How your company feels, what's really happening in terms of the culture is something that you can understand from looking at your ERGs, from talking to them, from interacting with them. So I continue to be in complete of the passion that they bring and plus the amount of time and effort that they bring. Because let us all remember, everybody who's part of the ERG is doing this as their second job or perhaps their third job, given now that we have a pandemic. But it's like there's no dearth of passion, no dearth of commitment. A lot of progress that I personally feel that a lot of companies have made is because of the work that the employee resource groups have done. So for me, they continue to be an inspiration. And I, as a head of DNI, my one of my um, 
guiding stars is what can I do to help facilitate what the ERGs are doing and amplify their impact and voice because they are definitely doing a lot. We need to provide a much wider and bigger platform to them. So definitely I, I get so much inspiration from everybody who's on, the, on, on an ERG, leading an ERG. And I really want to take this moment to thank you for all that you do to keep these, to keep all our companies in touch with how our employee base is feeling. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights. And I think what you're what you're saying just I mean, as it really hits the nail on the head, like how a lot of ERGs are putting in so much effort into this. And this isn't their full time job, right? A lot of these members are doing it because it's something that they're passionate to and they have a personal sort of connection with, right? So I guess um maybe maybe I'll start with you for for this next question, but but you because you you kind of highlighted you always want to make sure you're amplifying ERGs and, and wanting to um, you know, make sure that they're their voices are being heard are there do you have any kind of examples of how that's done in, in organizations and just or examples of how organizations can kind of foster that mutually beneficial relationship with the, with the ERGs yeah definitely I think I look at a lot of ways to do this very tactfully because a lot of the ERGs all our ERGs have executive sponsors so all the, the executive team gets some insight into what a particular group is doing but connecting what they are doing to in terms of like the microculture of that organization or making sure that it, their impact on the business is reflected is something that I consider is obviously part of my job and my responsibility. So a very tactical thing, whenever I do the DIB, like my team's QBRs, there is a whole section dedicated to all the events and the efforts that each ERG has put in because it's not like I'm leading diversity inclusion belonging. Here is all the things that I've done. But what I've done is just like an add on to the foundations that the ERGs build. So I always take that as an opportunity to highlight the work that the ERGs are doing because that feeds into my work. So making sure at the company level, we have that highlighted. Whenever we have our company kickoff, our sales kickoff, our customer conferences, we always have a spot reserved for each of the ERGs to bring in their speakers, to present their point of view. And finally, I know this question comes up a lot of times, but we want to make sure that we are highlighting the effort that the ERGs are putting in. And also we, we have worked on putting in a structure so that we can reward their efforts. It's not like you're doing a great job supporting us. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, but show appreciation beyond words in supporting with their individual professional development, whether it's rewarding them with spot bonuses, making sure that all that we are doing to highlight their efforts and also rewarding them at the same time and showing the business the value of it. Like when we run our engagement surveys, we very clearly point out this particular business unit has 20% of the population signed up as ERG representatives and look at what your inclusion score is versus another business unit where ERG representation is two or 3%. So that's directly connected to how the organization or the smaller micro cultures are moving and I see my role as using every opportunity to highlight that. So, and we definitely do this a lot in partnership with our ERGs. They tell us and guide us basically in terms of the programming that we are, that they are doing and how we can highlight and amplify their impact. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks for, for sharing that. And there's something that you said I want to touch on, but before that, I want to see if Torin or Ileana have anything to contribute to that specific part about, you know, those tactful, tactful approaches to kind of amplify your ERGs and create that mutually beneficial. Yeah, I think something that uh, maybe just to build upon what I said is that executive sponsors are super important. I think accountability is super important along with that, right? Uh, one thing we do uh, at Salesforce is we do provide monthly reporting and dashboards where our CEO gets uh, the metrics on each organizational business unit and how they are doing in terms of the I. Right, and there are things that are tracked like uh, diversity hires, for instance, promotion, what are the retention scores for the different populations. So accountability is super important and it's not just that on one person's shoulders. So for instance, we do have a diversity officer, but it's not just him being responsible or accountable for that. It's all the leaders of the organization. So I think that's in general what I would consider a best practice and something that, that probably all companies should have, right? It's not just saying we're preaching these, these are our goals and it's one person or it's the HR department in charge of that only. So it has to be spread across all the leadership teams. So that's one thing. 
I think the other thing that I found that it's super, super important is raising the visibility, not just the visibility, but the impact that these ERGs bring to the picture. And if that's communicated at, from the highest level, and then somehow it is consistent and cre creating goals and creating different ways that the different groups, the different people, employees can actually align to some of those goals, some of those metrics, and how the company can tell them how they can impact those, right? How they can participate in being executioners of those goals and contributing to those goals is very important. We have an internal methodology, we call it um, B2MOM, which stands for vision, values, methods, obstacles, and metrics. And it starts at the top with our CEO basically declaring, this is our B2MOM for the year, this is what we're aligning to, it's a living document, living and breathing document. But then after he does that, then all his leaders start trickling it down, adjusting to their organizational units, all the way down to the last individual contributor in the company. So that we accomplish two things. One is we, we have full alignment, full consistency for the year, but also we guarantee that one of those methods, it's going to be related to the ENI because that's part of the leadership team. The diversity officer has his own um, metrics and goals that he's setting. And then everybody else will be able to have visibility into that, understand what is the role, how they can participate, and even include it in their own personal B2MOM that it's available and visible to everyone in the company. So again, driving for that accountability. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. Um, Torn, Torn, is there any pieces that you want to add to that? Um, I'll, I'll just add on this, and, and those are those are some great insights in terms of the tactical and strategic parts of the work that you all are both leading. Um, anytime that you have persistent uh, and continued free unpaid labor, it's kind of like a balance between your desire for the fulfillment of the cause that you're contributing to, but then also the fatigue of contributing to that cause without necessarily having the sustainability. Um, and I feel like that's, those are two very compelling and almost uh, uh, forces that are pulling against each other. Um, and so I think it's really important for uh, ERG leaders to really recognize and understand that we need to be able to, we need to not sell ourselves short when we're thinking about the impact that we are creating for these organizations, right? Um, you know, spot bonuses are one way of, of, of recognizing somebody, right? Like I've always, you know, talked to colleagues and, and people who are like, you know, they gave me a hundred dollar Starbucks gift card. And it's like, oh, I need that. And it's that great. But another way to pay people is to make sure that it's part of that performance conversation throughout the year, not just at the end of the year, throughout the year, so that they know that you put together an event for 2,000 people, that they know that you put together, uh, you coordinated an effort between your institution and another institution that led to business for the company, right? Like those are actual tangible outputs that you're putting together. And so I think for, for, from that perspective, what that means is that compensation comes in promotion. That compensation comes in putting on some special projects that will get you into the pipelines, leadership positions, and things of that nature. So I think that's that's one thing I definitely wanted to add in there. Um, I think the other piece is is just the fact that um, from that perspective around just we're, how are we actually valuing these efforts, like making sure that leadership is is broadcasting that message. When you talk about amplifying, it's like your efforts will not go unnoticed. <laughs> because for so many people, I, I can't tell you how many people, how many young people early in career are so excited to take on these leadership roles. They're so excited to be a part of these organizations. And they, they say, look, we want to bring you in to, to consult with us. We want to bring you in to speak with us. They don't recognize that they're going to have to go back and sell internally to make it happen. They don't realize all those steps that are going to have to take place. And it oftentimes becomes difficult when the leadership does not recognize the value. And so I cannot express enough just how much that leadership impetus, that leadership um, um, val like placement of value on this, on this work as part of the strategic priority, not just an initiative or program, but a strategic priority. That's mm -hmm. how you begin to elevate this and amplify it to where it needs to be in the fashion that Ileana has described and Madhavi has certainly described as well. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, you really tie in all of what oh, um, uh, I was about to, to bring up, which was, I think, Maravi, you said it first, and then Liana, and then, you know, Torn, you tied it up with about the role of an executive sponsor and how crucial that is in terms of getting that backing and that support um, to kind of, you know, to drive and, and amplify the ERG. And, and um, I think really as the involvement of 
the Black Employee Resource Group that we have um, at Accenture and seeing how the, how our um, executive sponsor has become more involved and how that has impacted um, how the, the ERG has, has been amplified is so important because your executive sponsor should just be, we are, we're a large company, we're, we're global. The, the Black, our bold, our Black Employee Resource Group is in specifically in Canada. And so our executive sponsor is in Canada, but he's, situ he's situated in Toronto. Meanwhile, we have offices in, in Ottawa, in Vancouver, like in, in Montreal. And so he's not physically present in those spaces. And we need someone who is able to tap into their network to, you know, kind of a, engage with other groups on our behalf and, and who's going to be that ally for us. Because, you know, I, I look at, um, our, we do we do have um, Black employees within Canada, I would say in Vancouver, not as many, right? So when I lead events, when I'm, when I'm supporting events, that are specifically for the Vancouver office, having those allies there is really crucial, really essential. It's not an event I'm putting on just for the black employees, right? It's a, it's an event, it's a, it's something that we're trying to reach like a broader audience and you need to have that support. And a lot of that comes with, you know, who in leadership is supporting you, who's encouraging their teams, who's, you know, really amplifying your group and having an executive sponsor who's tapping into those networks at those different locations and those different spots and helping drive you, um, you know, your you and your initiatives. I think that's really uh, essential. So I just want Wanted to touch base on that, but uh, Ilian, I think I cut you off. You were about to say something. <laughs> no worries, Lisa. Great points that you're bringing up. No, one thing I wanted to mention because Torin um, kind of like highlighted the fatigue, and I know there have been a couple of comments in the chat about that, right? And Mara, you, you have mentioned how hard the ERGs, the leaders of the ERGs, and even the members and contributors actually work, right? So one of the things that we we saw from the evolution of um, all the ERGs at, at Salesforce also was that. At the beginning, it was really hard to recognize that work or their work because there were no metrics or channels or initiatives that could say, hey, this is really something we can embed quickly into the fabric of the organization. So what I would encourage all of you to do is, depending on your organization, you may have things, for instance, related to community work. I think there are already a lot of frameworks around community work and how to measure that. For us, it was something we call BTOs the voluntary time off. And each employee has a target. Every year, we need to fill 56 hours of voluntary work with the communities. So at the beginning, when all the ERGs started, those hours didn't count towards BTO, right? And one could argue that that's kind of like community work. It's internal community work. So what we did, and one of the things that our chief diversity officer did when he first came in, was saying, hey, all this work has to be recognized. And we already have this mechanism. So let's embed it into the framework that we already have. So suddenly, all the time that was put in by the leadership teams of the ERGs into their planning meetings, the strategic meetings, community engagement, events that they were putting together, suddenly immediately contributed to those 56 hours. So BTO counted and it was a relief for a lot of the employees because also they created the space for their leaders or their managers to say, hey, this is something that the company is pushing for. This is something that we're supporting. You will have the space and the time to dedicate also for, for those activities. So I think if you're a leader out there, if you're in the audience and you are managing a team, whether you're in an ERG or not, just make sure that to acknowledge the work and give your employees the space and the time so they can devote their efforts and also hopefully be recognized for that. I think, Mara, you mentioned also spot bonuses and touring, you mentioned performance evaluations to embed it into those, that is great. I think uh, the evolution that we are seeing and, and who knows what the future would look like, right? But I think a lot of the, the people who are in this area are starting to think that, you know, these leadership positions will probably have to end up being official or formalized roles uh, at some point, right? They will have to become a job description and a job headcount for the different organizations that are a member of that. So I would say, yeah, that's not too far off that that will be created at some point in the future. But in the meantime, I think something that's really nice is to recognize that as part of uh, your contributions um, and as part of your compensation too. So I think that's something we have embarked on for those people that are in leadership positions for the ERGs, because it's recognizing that it's additional work, they are developing themselves, they are providing additional growth for the company, and their contributions are super, super valuable. Yeah, yeah, I just want to add, yeah, Ileana, that's a very, very important point. I just want to add there, like, when we started looking at Octum, how we can support ERGs, the fatigue piece was very important. So like, you know, we started with like, as I said, we are going to pay quarterly spot bonuses to our ERG leads. Okay, great. Like that's a great place to start. 
but they are not going to be your ERG leads forever. Mm -hmm. And we do the same when we look at the business. Like you, you do succession planning when you're looking at different business units. I very strongly believe that we need to do the same with the ERG. It's like who is going to come in and become the co-chair next year? How are you investing in them? So almost all our ERGs also have committee heads. So we have smaller committees like event professional development. So we made it a point that the spot bonuses are not just um, limited to the ERG heads, but we are giving it to the committee leads as well, because this year they're taking up a small portion of this work, but we need to invest in their time, effort and energy and see like, we are interested in this being permanent. We are interested in succession planning here. So when we offer professional development opportunities to our ERG leads, we tell them from each group, bring three or four people who you see as your successors. Let's rope them into this professional development opportunity as well. Because you can't just do it like, let me do it for now because it looks good and everybody is happy. Then what's going to happen after two years or when that person leaves your company, you need to invest in that structure and you need to invest for long term because the feeling of fatigue is real. And the more you're distributing this reward, the more you're giving it more stability and structure and the fact that it's going to scale as your company scales. So that's kind of an important point that you have to think of it in the long term of how you're supporting the groups as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's really crucial uh, a piece to kind of bring in to look at that, um, to see how you're building and developing that ERG and the members in it besides the, the lead. And I think that's not something that every company touches a point, but as a very kind of essential part to, to, to developing and continuing on within that ERG. Yeah, thanks for appreciating that. I see we have a question. Actually, no, I think we, we covered it. Um, the audience members were just wondering um, more about what to do um, in terms of extra, if somebody's taking out this on as extra work, how do you show that you're recognizing them? And I think all of you have kind of covered covered that that piece. Yeah. So um, I think maybe I want to go back to a little bit about you you talking about, all of you kind of talked about pat patier that's associated with this. Um, so essentially, you know, when we, we look at it specifically in the example of the Black Lives Matter movement and many ERGs and their, their leaderships being called um, um, into volunteering and weighing in on policy and statements and responses to the recent events. Um, how do you how do you feel um, this this would impact the ERG? So do you see this as productive? Do you see this as imposing? And essentially, what kind of advice would you give to ERG leaderships in kind of communicating and negotiating their role in this aspect and the expect how to set expectations and boundaries as as an ERG when when they're approached by business leads on, on things like this. Because for a lot of them, these these experiences are, are lived experiences, right? And more personal, personal to that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd love to take a quick crack at this. Um, yeah. Uh, so January 6th, I actually did a program for an insurance company that everybody here would know. And the program was focused on um, some early in career talent that they uh, have and have the potential to join them in the future. Um, that was before the insurrection happened later in the day. Um, and so the content was around, you know, authenticity and finding the power of their voice and things of that nature and how are you gonna stand out when you enter the workforce and those things. But the thing is, is that as much as their questions were pointed towards, well, what are the realities that we're stepping into? I wanted them to understand like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a grounded optimist, right? So I wanna acknowledge what's real and good while also acknowledging what's not so good, but looking for that light always, right? Um, so I wanna, I wanna uh, give them those insights. But at the same time, I let them know that when I'm in those rooms, when I'm talking to CEOs, when I'm talking to executive teams, I'm, I'm letting them know that they need to be cultivating themselves, that they are deserving of that talent, right? And so from that perspective, ERG members as community members, as individuals, as people who have kids who, who may be affected more by the pandemic, but more by the racial injustice, more by discrimination and bias. You know, we have our fingers, and Madhavi, I love that you said the nervous system, right? <laughs> we can tell you if this organization is healthy or not. We can tell you if its heartbeat is what it says it's going to do with its actions. And I think it's really important for organizational leaders to understand that these ERG leaders do not have to tell people a fake, a fake promise. Like we can tell people like this organization is not ready for you. You know, we can tell people, yes, they said it's important, but they still haven't done anything in the last three months, right? And from that perspective, I think it's critical that, that these organizations really recognize and understand that 
the, the promise of inclusion, the promise of diversity and equity, you know, those things are not things to be played with, especially if you have ERG leaders who are volunteering their time and their efforts. Um, so that's the one thing that I definitely wanted to share with you all today that, you know, just that, that perspective on what does it really mean to fulfill a promise? What does it really mean to deliver on a promise that you are promoting and putting on your website and putting in your PDF of your, you know, annual report on diversity, right? And so it's really important to recognize that you deliver on that promise. The other part of that token is that some of those organizations came out with big, bold claims and big, bold commitments, you know, $100 million equity justice initiative, $10 million over the next 10 years, five years, et cetera. And some of those groups actually tapped their ERG teams and leadership teams to say, you're going to help us deploy this money. You're going to help us figure out where this capital is going to be most impactful. And from that perspective, this time has allowed us to elevate to a place where, you know, where you were thinking about, oh my gosh, I have $30,000 for the entire year to feed people, put on programming, have this happy hour, right? Bring in, bring in a speaker. And now it's like, wait a second, I got $20 million to help deploy into HBCUs or into community funds or, you know what I mean? So th those, those opportunities now, I think, need to be more frequent and recognized with that kind of importance and sense of urgency. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's really great. And looking really to that that ERG team as sort of your advisory board versus like expecting them to be doing all the work, you know, and, and making sure that 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 what your message and that promise is genuine, because I think we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of, of companies like, as you were saying, come out with messages and have no action behind it. And then you have companies who are actually making thoughtful adjustments, actually have the support and like the the the, the bones of who, who how they're going to formulate this plan and this strategy and I think you need more of that like I think I see a lot of I forget what the term was but I know the reverse would be active allyship versus I guess like passive allyship or what whatever you would you would kind of use there and see what you're actually doing versus what you're saying that you're doing and so yeah that's really really kind of important mm -hmm. to, to highlight. Um, Ileana or, or Madhavi, do you have a I, I just want to jump yeah. in. I, I also think like this summer, though we have seen a lot of this, this, the events of this summer have changed a lot. It's not just like companies can make press statements and move away from it because it, it uh, to me, it's very historical and very like, you know, life changing for this. One thing that really caught my attention of like how the internal ERG leadership and the general community kind of came together because we have all seen all these companies, including us at Octo, we are like making these statements on Twitter and CEOs going out and sharing this. But I don't know if many of you may have noticed, we had a Twitter campaign around like with the hashtag of like show the receipts. And that mm -hmm. is where I think the ERG groups, the ERG leadership can become very valuable. It's holding your own executives and your own companies accountable. Okay, we had this last summer, Come this summer, let's take, you know, a postmortem of what we have done. Where are we lacking? What are we going to do moving forward? Because in terms of reacting to the new cycle, we all did a lot and with a lot of good intentions. But then everybody gets busy. Business comes in the mm -hmm. way. We need to cut 10 priorities. We need to hit our sales targets. I really, for me, it's like, you know, the ERG leadership is going to keep the companies accountable and make sure that we are delivering what we need to deliver. Because this is not one of those of like, let's make a ton of promises and move on. Because this this time, like showing your receipts and, and delivering on your promises is going to distinguish and distinguish the companies that are very serious about it, want to do this in the long term versus just making like the right noise at the right time. So I, I definitely think the role of the ERGs has expanded given the situation that we were last summer it, it, it's going to be much more huge than we imagined yeah and, yeah and if i may add to that you know it's something that i would like to also call the attention for everybody is when you start thinking about a bigger role for the ergs and amplifying the impact and all those that are coming now into the picture a lot more often one thing that internally with ERGs, something you have to consider is the leadership and the level of the leadership or the seniority of the leadership in the ERGs uh, is, right? Because it can be really full spectrum, right? You can have employees that are super committed, they become leaders of the ERGs, but they may be very junior in their tenure or in their even in their professional life. So I think when you start looking at that and the field can, can be very broad, you can have the super senior leaders, right? Very high level titles with a lot of influence in the organization and they are participants too. But I think one thing we all have to keep in mind is 
for the leaders of the ERGs, regardless of where they are in the spectrum, they need a lot of support as well. So we cannot just throw it up to them that you need to set up the policy and the responses from a peer perspective, right, about this crisis, for instance, because they may not be ready for that or may, may not be as prepared. So I would just try to call that to your attention. They need help. We all need help on that side. I think uh, from an HR perspective, it's something to keep in mind in terms of developing those leaders as well as part of the organization. And then it also becomes even more important, paramount, I would say, to have executive sponsors and advisors to those ERGs to help that leadership team, depending on where they are in the spectrum, right, in the evolution of the ERG and the seniority they bring to the table, to make sure that all the support that they need, it's going to be there. And it's not just going to be like your task with this and good luck with it, right? So, <laughs> and maybe it's someone who hasn't even managed people before, right? Mm -hmm. Even starting with something as basic as simple as that. So yeah. let's make sure that they are supported and that we raise the need for that kind of um, advisory support, having mentors, having coaches, having sponsors for those leaders or those ERG committee members, right? That are leading the different efforts. It could be events, as you said, Madhavi. It could be someone in charge of the growth of the ERG. It could be someone in charge of uh, philanthropy efforts or community outreach for that ERG. But that's something very, very important. And that's something that I think it has raised in priority as well with all the yeah. events that we have seen in the past year or so. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Like it's really an integrated strategy. Like when I look at with us, um, specifically with our Black Employee Resource Group, we have connections with our recruitment team about that strategy. We have connections with, with our, our corporate social responsibility team. Um, our uh, our executive sponsor happens to be for our organization, our, our Canada CEO. So so he's heavily involved with what's happening with us and brings it back to his team. And there's there's other groups that are supporting in conjunction, like our learning team. Our, our We have a race and equity roundtable team. And then just sort of, you need to have all those different pieces the owners shouldn't just be on the erg they should be having a lot of support and like when i when i say that like for example in terms of advising we have what we uh, our our organization was building out sort of um a learning board on anti-racism strategies and so of course our erg was asked um to kind of provide input and provide feedback on it but it was not the onus was not on the team to be the ones to create this entire yeah. learning board and and you know distribute it out right that was never that own it's it's they're supposed to be sort of an advisor and provide perspectives right and so mm -hmm. i think that's really crucial to how you're using your your erg and how you're you're making sure the onus aren't on these individuals who also you know might be impacted by this quite personally right so um and and to to make sure that you're supporting them and giving them what they they need to kind of be successful and have, have yeah, that's that's really great. Thanks for for sharing all of you. And I know we have we have such so many questions that were left. It's such a good conversation. But um, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up with with maybe one more question um, for for each of you. And so this is the the final question that we have to have here. So, what do you predict um, to be the greatest focus for the world of ERGs in the next like five to ten years? What do you suggest sort of organizations or employees to do now in order to help get there? So you're like one big piece of advice and like prediction and advice for, for the future of ERGs. Um, either anyone can jump, jump in first. I know uh, this is the big I ask. Yeah, I, yeah. I, would, I would definitely say one piece of advice is uh, for the ERG leaders and members to rec recognize that they are doing a lot and ask for help. And make that visible. Like I, I being a DNI head to me is like I can only uh, be able to amplify your voice. You have to tell me what your needs are. So don't ever undersell yourself. Like okay, I'm doing this job, but maybe I'm not doing great at like my ERG work. I only spent like three hours this week. But like, come on, like who has extra time of three hours spending it on this? So one, recognize that you are doing a a huge amount of work for your company try to work towards pushing like either your HR division, your head of DNI to amplify, to connect with them of what support they can provide. Because as I said at the start, this is the responsibility of the company. You are sharing in a lot of that load. So please make your needs, your demands, and your ask for support more vocal. So that would definitely be something that I would put forward. And in terms of prediction, I, I, de I definitely think, I know we have been saying this for a very long time, but I think we're very close to that becoming more, more a reality, that ERGs are going to drive a lot of the bottom line and the business for companies. It's important to recognize, we already say that ERGs are not social clubs, it's a community center, it's a hub, as I said, it's the nervous system, but they are going to become very soon the bottom line and the business center 
for a lot of what companies are doing, especially given like the global presence and the pandemic. So there is there is a lot in front for the ERGs to look forward to and guide the companies from the front rather than just like be behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Warner um, Liano? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, I can I can go next. So I I agree with something Madavi just said about the business impact to the bottom line. I think that's a big trend. I think it's going to consolidate in the next five to ten years or, or three to five years, depending on how fast the evolution goes, right? But um, it's like um, if some of you may may read the Affinity magazine, um, <laughs> they call the ERGs as the grown ups of the Affinity groups, and then they call the BRGs business resource groups as the grown ups within the ERG ranks, right? So think about it, that's part of the natural evolution. You start as an affinity group, transferring to an employee resource group, ultimately becoming a business resource group because you're really gonna be focused on not just doing all the great work that we're doing today, but also then also impacting the bottom line of the businesses and the organization. That's when you really will have what I would call the ultimate power as an ERG, right? Not just the community and the soft metrics, but also really the hard metrics for an organization in the corporate world. I think that's on one hand. Uh, the other trend, or not so much trend, but the other prediction, if, if you may call it, is I do believe that these roles are going to be formalized and they are going to have a, a higher voice and higher participation, not just internally with the companies, but externally. And it's going to have a lot of visibility into the positioning and the branding and the perspective that the companies have in their communities, whether that's in their community, local community, in their state, in their, in their country. So depending on the organization, depending on the power of those ERGs, I think they can be very, very influential parts or groups within, within the business that can have if, effects and lasting impact beyond the boundaries of the organization. Yeah, yeah, no, I entirely agree, but I'll, I'll torn, torn, maybe give your, your um, last piece as well. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe more of a hope instead of a prediction. Okay. I would say recognizing the power of intersectionality and intersectional identities and being able to unify around a common purpose. Um, I think that the events of last year um, brought a lot of people to the streets that do not look like me and Eunice. Um, and I think that if we bring that same kind of energy and that tenacity to creating change, we're going to see a lot of people who are no longer fighting for uh, the, the small budgets, but rather thinking about the bigger picture of how do we elevate our cause internally and externally into the world. So that's my hope. Yeah, thanks. And the only thing I would add to that is just, yeah, organizations, the, our organizations recognizing that you have all this in-house talent that's untapped and you should be, you know, utilizing that and, and promoting and advocating for those groups. And and even more so when you look at, you know, from a recruitment standpoint, I think my future predictions is people are going to be asking about this, right? At the recruitment stage, they're going to be like, what are, what's your organization doing? Like, are there ERGs, right? I don't think there's going to be a way that organizations can get away with not having these groups and not supporting and driving these kind of inclusive practices. So I think that's kind of where, where we're headed. Um, and I know it took us three minutes over, but this has just been such a great and lovely conversation with the three of you. Um, I hope for the people who are here listening that you got a lot of good, um, valuable, you know, take takes away from this. Um, and I hope everyone has a really great rest of their experience at the Culture Summit. And thank you so much to our, our panel speakers for being able to, to be here and share your thoughts of wisdom today. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a really great to have all of you. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, James. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Take care.